The relational database uh, technology was invented by a guy by the name of Ted Codd, Dr. Ted Codd at IBM. It's based on relational algebra uh, and relational calculus. It is a very mathematically rigorous uh, form of data management that we can prove mathematically, prove to be functionally complete. Uh, and this, this work was done uh, in the early 70s by an IBM fellow by the name of Dr. Ted Codd. He published his papers and really based on, on those publications, Oracle decided to see if we couldn't beat, well four guys, me and three other guys, see if we couldn't beat IBM to market uh, with this technology based on the, the published IBM research papers. And in fact, we did. There are lots of times, especially in the early days, uh, that, were, that were very, very difficult. I think, I think the most difficult thing, experience I had was in 1990 when Oracle had its, had its only loss quarter in history. And we've been in business for 20 years. Of those 20 years, we lost money one quarter. And we had a very difficult time because um, we, we had doubled our sales virtually every year for, for 10 years. Nine, nine out of 10 years, 10 out of 11 years. It was really quite an amazing run. We were the fastest growing company in history. Still, we're, still are the you know, fastest growing company in history over a long period of time. And suddenly we'd hit a wall. We, were, we would reach a billion dollars in revenue and we were having serious management problems all over the place. And the people who were running the company, the billion dollar company, were the same people that had run the company when we were a 50 million dollar company, one twentieth the size. And I had an, had a, an incredible sense of loyalty to those, to those people who'd worked with me to build Oracle. And it was a very painful realization in 1990 that I was going to have to change the management team, that the, that the company had outgrown the management, uh, that people who are good at running a $50 million company are not necessarily, those are the same skills. It's not, they're just different, not one is better or worse, they're just entirely different skill set in running a $50 million company than a, than a billion dollar company. And uh, both skill sets are rare and precious, but we needed a different group of managers and virtually the entire management team had to be replaced. And that means I had to ask people who I'd worked with for a decade to leave. I had to fire people. Uh, and that was the most difficult, the most, the most difficult thing I had to do in, in business, asking the, you know, a bunch of people to leave Oracle. But I had no choice. I'd have to either ask them to leave Oracle or everyone would have to leave Oracle because there wouldn't be any Oracle left. So it was a, in that sense, it was a simple choice. It was uh, thousands of people worked at Oracle. Uh, they deserved the best leadership we could find. Uh, and my primary, you know, my primary responsibility was to the company and all, all of the staff, you know, all of our shareholders and all of our customers. And uh, therefore, I, t I had to choose. And if I couldn't make that decision, then I had to go. I was absolutely shocked uh, the, the way we, we treated the Iraqis. You know, we, we were incredibly aggressive against them. And, uh, you know, I mean, was that really right? Couldn't we have done that at different, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, by the way. Uh, of course we're aggressive against the Iraqis. They were, you know, they invaded, they invaded Kuwait. They were threatening our oil supplies. They were threatening the world order. And of course, we, you know, it was, it was the job of our armed forces to defeat the enemy. It is my job to you know, go out in the marketplace and win. And uh, we you know, run ads that compare our products to the competitors' products. We don't lie about that. We just say, we can do this, they can't. We name the, comp the competition. We, it's it's fact-based advertising. And uh, we say very clearly that, we, you know, you know, that we're faster and these, these tests prove it. We're more, we're more reliable, and these tests prove it. We're more economical, and so we'll name a we'll, we'll name a competitor. That's considered that that's not terribly you know uh, even though the facts are true, it's considered a little bit rude by some people. Uh, I don't understand. I don't think it's immoral. Uh, I think that we are giving true facts uh, to customers, giving valuable information to customers, so they can they can make better decisions. 
Uh, it is Bill Gates's job to make Microsoft the biggest, you know, the biggest company on earth. That's what he's paid for. It's my job for Oracle to move from the number two software company in the world to become the number one software company in the world. That's that's my job. That's what I'm paid for. If I'm and I'm, if I'm not aggressive enough in the pursuit of that, if I'm not successful in the pursuit of that, I should be gotten rid of. If a general running uh, Desert Storm is not aggressive enough and successful enough in the pursuit of that goal, he should be fired. The corporation's primary goal is to de defeat the competition in the marketplace. Uh, I think that you know my primary function is to have Oracle, you know, is to make Oracle successful, uh, to make it a good and interesting place to work, because we don't want people to leave. People, you know, this is this is America. People can change jobs, and they'll go, they'll go, they'll, and people like to work with other intelligent and interesting people. They like to do interesting things, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, or, you know, Oracle offer, you know, we have fantastic salary scales. I think we're the highest paying company in Silicon Valley. We're, we have, uh, you know, wonder, you know won wonderful benefits, all of these things. But again, don't mistake any of that for altruism. You know, that, that is in our interest to, to retain our employees. Uh, you know, their job, my job, is to build better products in the competition, sell those products in the marketplace, and eventually supplant Microsoft and move from being number two to number one. That is our, our reason for being. Oracle is the number one software company in the world for providing, providing technology to manage information. Uh, but we're only the number two software company, number one software company for information management, number two software company overall. Microsoft is the number one software company. But right now we're living at the dawn of the information age, not the dawn of the PC age. So we're wonderfully positioned to pass Microsoft and become number one. That's my job. Personal computer was designed as a standalone device. Device. Uh, there were no, there was no internet around 1981 when the PC, uh, the PC was invented. There uh, weren't a lot of local area networks and corporations and schools and government agencies when the, back in 1981. The world has changed. There are networks everywhere, around the world, in offices and schools, in major government uh, institutions. So, why not have computer networks? that are similar to television networks or telephone networks. A television network is enormously complicated. It's got satellites and microwave relay stations and cable head ends and recording studios. And you have, you have this huge professionally managed network accessed by a very low cost and simple appliance, the television. Anyone can learn how to use a television. 97% of American households have televisions. 94% of American households have telephones. Telephone. Again, a very simple appliance attached to an enormously complex professionally managed network. Why shouldn't the computer network be just the same? I decided to go in the computer business uh, in college. I, I started working, working part-time uh, programming. I, I found that I found it in, in a very short period of time I could make more money writing programs than uh, a tenured professor at the University of Chicago was making. And I was you know, a teenager. And I said, this is kind of cool. And uh, it was also fun. It was like a big game. It was like working on puzzles. So I enjoyed it. It paid extremely well. I could work at home. I could work at my own hours. No one quite, you know, uh, and, and the computer, and I closely associated with computers because they were absolutely a slave to reason. They knew nothing about fashion. They were completely logical. And I enjoyed spending time with them. So I liked what I was doing. It was very profitable. It was very creative. And it was also giving me immediate feedback. I could start writing a program, and within a, several hours, I could have a result. You know, Freud defines maturity as the ability to, to, to defer gratification. And the great thing about programming is you don't have to be mature at all, because you don't have to defer gratification for more than a few hours. You get, you get wonderful, tight feedback, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, uh, that's, that's, and that's characteristic, by the way, of games and sports. The reason why games and sports are so popular is because you win or lose very quickly. You get immediate feedback. Uh, it's a very tight loop. You don't wait hours or days or, or years before you find out if you're winning or losing. You find out find, a second and a, half, and a half after you release that basketball, you know whether it's gone in or not. It was in school and they noticed when I was writing programs for school that I was, like, I was getting done faster than everybody else. So they offered me, you know, they offered me a, jo you know, offered me a job. Uh, and I figured out very, very quickly that rather than being paid by the hour, I was much better off being paid by the program. <laughs> so I, I figured that, so I, I was working for the university and then I, I started doing consulting for, for local businesses. 
and uh, that worked very well. I don't think my personality has changed much since I was five years old. Uh, I think, as I explained to the kids just a little while ago, uh, probably the single most important aspect of my personality, and as far as determining my success, has been my uh, my questioning of conventional wisdom, my doubting of experts just because they're experts, and questioning of authority. And while that can be very, very painful in terms of your relationship with your parents and your relationship with your teachers, it's enormously useful in life. I was uh, adopted with my own, within my own family when I was nine months old. I was, I was uh, born in New York City. Uh, my mother was 19. She wasn't married uh, and uh, really was unable to care for me. I tried, tried until I was nine months old, and then I was adopted by my maternal aunt and uncle in Chicago and moved to Chicago, the south side of Chicago. You know, I'll never, never, never again complain about a bad neighborhood moving from the Lower East Side of Manhattan to a still worth, worse neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. So after, after my ninth month, I kept my mouth shut about the neighborhood. I believed until I was 12 years old that, uh, that I was not adopted. I had no idea that I was adopted within, within, within my own family. Uh, so again, I, I don't attribute very much of my life, my personality to my adoption. I, I do attribute it, uh, an awful lot to my relationship with my father, uh, who was uh, a Russian immigrant, came, uh, came here, was very, very poor, uh, dearly loved this country as only an immigrant can, uh, loved our government as only an immigrant can. He was a, he was a pilot uh, in uh, World War II, a uh, bomber pilot. He, uh, he really had the philosophy, my country right or wrong, he never questioned the government's policies, never questioned authority, and didn't really want me to question authority. Uh, I had some teachers when I was very, very young that I, that I thought were telling me things that weren't true. And when I tried to ask questions, they basically wanted me to respond, basically you know, parrot back what they said. They really weren't interested in a discourse with a child or a debate with a child. They said this was true, and you are smart if you can repeat it back to me exactly what I said to you. And I had a real problem with that as well. So I, I had very strong authoritarian figures, both in school uh, and at home, which served as wonderful examples of how not to be. My mom was supportive, not, and, and, I, and I had a mixture of teachers. Some, some of the teachers were wonderful, and some of the teachers were awful. But the awful, teach, the awful teachers served a good purpose in terms of being a bad, you know, bad example. All examples are good. Bad examples are useful. Good examples are useful. And uh, it taught me to question experts, uh, to question authority uh, figures. Don't assume just because they're an authority or even just because they're an expert that they're right. You know, in other words, think things out for yourself. Come to your own judgments. Don't simply conform uh, to conventional ways of thinking, conventional ways of dressing, conventional ways of acting. That a lot of, this, uh, a lot of things are, are based on fashion. Even morality at times is based on fashion. It was once, fa you know, slavery was once not considered not to be immoral. Uh, you know, people are, you know, people are shocked that the uh, the ancient Greeks had slaves. That that we had slavery in this country as recently as you know, 130, 140 years ago. So there are more moral facts. You have to really go back to first principles and think things out for yourself, whether they're scientific principles or moral principles or business ideas or product ideas. You have to think things out for yourself. Well, I don't know if you watched the movie Independence Day, but uh, the discourse between the father and the son in, 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 in Independence Day, uh, where the father said, the government knows everything. You know, the government has experts for everything. If they want HBO, they'll call you. I don't, again, I don't know if you, if you saw this. But it, I, I think it's this notion that we really can't understand, but the government is always right. We really can't understand, but our teachers are always right. We really can't understand, but our clergymen are always right. And just, you know, use them as, as your sole beacons in life and don't try to figure these things out on your own because you're really, you really can't, you're not smart enough. And just find the appropriate experts and follow their light. I think we're born slaves to reason. And it's really reason that's beaten out of us uh, through a, 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 pro, you know, a process of trying to please our teachers. We, I, I think we have two fundamental drives in our life. We want to, we want to be loved and we want to please people. And we, and we know how to think, we know how to reason. And these are often quite at odds. 
because we're asked to believe a certain things, you know, believe certain, you know, certain things are correct. You know, that we have to wear, wear our hair a certain length and dress a certain way. And, and if you want to be loved, you want to be accepted by your peers, you want to be accepted by your family. And there's a t tension there. And, and sometimes we were, trying, we're pleasing our parents, sometimes we're pleasing our peers. But uh, we're often just conforming to some fashion figuring out what the group wants from us and then conforming to that because we do want to be accepted and loved. There's this other fundamental drive inside of us that, that, that where there's often tension between the two and that is the ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to come to conclusions as to what works and what doesn't, what's fair and what's not fair, what's right and what's wrong. And when fashion and the pursuit of love gets, you know, uh, is in conflict with reason, too often, fashion and the pursuit of love wins. In my case, it didn't. I do not give fashionable answers to questions. And uh, that's why, um, and that's what shocks people. Because when you ask a question, you expect everyone to answer it exactly the same way. In fact, you really don't need to ask the question because this is the fashionable answer. And, uh, you know, and whenever you give an answer that you think about it, your, your own answer, what you really believe to be true rather than the fashion answer, people are, are, are sometimes shocked, amused, or even horrified, depending on the question. I don't think it's a par paradoxical at all. I think they're, they're similar. I think we, are, we as human beings are endlessly curious about ourselves. And, we're and we love to, to test ourselves constantly. We, and, we t and we find all sorts of arenas to test ourselves in. And you can tell, you know, uh, right now I have a, a racing sail, I have the fastest racing sailboat in the world, maybe the, fa the, the fastest sa racing sailboat in history. Uh, Sayonara has r raced 26 times, we have 24 firsts and two seconds. And I'm discovering all sorts of things about me as I race that boat. Uh, I discover all sorts, about, all sorts of things about me every day as Oracle competes with Microsoft for supremacy in the software world. So, there's a wonderful, you know, there's a wonderful saying that, that, that's dead wrong uh, that says, you know, why did you climb the mountain? I climbed the mountain because it was there. That is utter nonsense, it's ludicrous and absurd. You climbed the mountain because you were there and you were curious if you could do it. You wondered what it would be like. Uh, you wondered what the view was from the top. Um, and that's how we explore the thing that we're most interested in it interested in is exploring our own limits and, exp uh, and exploring our relationship with others. We're much more interested in each other and ourselves than we are everything else. I think life is an, I think there are two things important in life and that's, that's self-discovery, learning about yourself and your relationship with others. And I spend my en entire life in those two areas. So, but, you know, you know, balance, balance is, is interesting, you know, play versus work, you know. What is play? What is work? Define it to me. Is work something you get paid for and play something you don't? Uh, I put a lot of work into my flying. I put, do put a lot of work into my sailing. Uh, I used to play tournament chess. I put a lot of work into that. And they were all forms of exploration. Uh, I put a lot of work into my career, you know, into my job where I get paid. But they're all kind of in pursuit of the same thing, in, in pursuit of this self-discovery and discovery of my own limits. Um, and an accumulation of world experiences that give me a, a worldview. The best thing about my life is the people I get to meet these days. Uh, if there's any advantage in celebrity, it is you get to meet absolutely wonderful and fascinating people. Uh, you know, Walter Cronkite and I went out sailing on Sayonara, and uh, I've known Walter for a while, and we, you know, we went from being casual acquaintances kind of through business to being being friends and he's just an extraordinary man who's, who's lived an extraordinary life and I could you know sit for hours you know listen, listening to he, he and his wife tell stories uh, I can give you lots of examples of wonderful people I've met one of whom is here my, you know Michael Milken a man who was actually you know singled out as the symbol of evil of greed of the 1980s this is one of the most humane and gifted men I've ever met in my life. Michael has raised more money for cancer research than any other human being on Earth. Michael has been dedicated to education for 20 years, and uh, because of uh, someone's political advantage, they decided to uh, to put him in jail for crimes that no one before or since you know has done. And I, you know, and it was not it's not terribly fashionable to uh, to be a huge supporter of Michael Milken. I mean, I, I'm honored to have him as my friend, 
uh, I, and uh, I think he has made incredible contributions to, to humankind already with a lot more, with a lot more coming up. Uh, so, but it's, it's a long list of wonderful people that I've met and wonderful relationships that I, that I work at uh, that has enriched my life and I suppose therein, and I think therein is the balance. The, there's a balance between self-exploration and building relationships with others. And that is, uh, you, know, you know, that's how, what are the important things in life. I think uh, Winston Churchill has a wonderful quote, which is, uh, you like, make a living by what you get, you, uh, you, you make a life by what you give. I think we live, uh, we, if we live intelligently, we devise a strategy to intelligently pursue happiness. And there should be a wonderful, there should be a book saying the, the intelligent pursuit of happiness, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide. But there isn't such a book, but there, there should be. And I think more than anything else, that's what, what all of us need is this, this guide to how to intelligently pursue happiness. I mean, Jefferson guaranteed our right to do it, but no, but, but he, didn't, he didn't give us a, uh, he didn't give us a, a map. And I think uh, we should think of altruism, giving, as a strategy for happiness. Forget, forget whether the morality of it all, you know, that's the right thing to do. Instead, think of it as something totally in your self-interest. If you can help others, you will feel great. The more you can help, the more intelligently you can help, the, the bigger lever you can get on the world to make it better, the better you will feel about yourself, the more joy you will, you will experience. You know, that is the road to bliss. That is the intelligent pursuit of happiness. And, and that, is what we, you know, that is what we should do. That is my argument for giving. Not simply that it's the right and moral thing to do. It happens to also be that. But I don't find that as persuasive, as persuasive, is that is the road to happiness. The most deeply afraid I can remember being was once my mother came, I guess I was five, and my, my mother worked. Now I, was a little, I think I was a little older, because I was, I was now I, I guess, I might, have, I might have been six. And I went to school, went to preschool, went to school, and my mother came home very late from work. So it was six o'clock, so no one was home, and I was very worried that my mother wouldn't come home. And I was deeply afraid. That's the only time I can remember being deeply afraid. So I was making all sorts of deals with God if he would return her to me. There's a, a, mild, a mild degree of fear. There's certainly, there, there certainly is fear. I mean, fear, you know, um, sociobiologists will tell you that fear is the prevalent human emotion. Fear is, fear is the dominant emotion in all of this. But your expression was deeply afraid. I, I certainly, you know, uh, feel a little stressed if I'm in a brand new, you know, I just bought a jet fighter and I was, you know, flying it for the first time. And if we're doing, flying very low to the ground and doing aerobatics very low to the ground, it's, it's I wouldn't call it fear, but it's a little bit of a rush, it, and it's kind of mild fear uh, that goes on that that, that uh, gets gets the adrenaline going, and I thrive on that. So I, I like that's that that's a pleasant, you know, I don't know if you want to call that fear, but it, you know that's that's a somewhat pleasant experience for me. I mean, that makes me a little bit odd, but uh, extreme fear, no, is awful, but. Mild, you know, mild, you know, out on the edge a little bit, where you have a mild sensation of apprehension and concern, uh, is something I actually enjoy. We're constantly testing ourselves. We're we're we're, tr we're, we're, re we're trying to understand our own level of competency, our ability to control our own world, the ability to put ourselves at risk and then save our our own lives. Uh, so I think, again, this is a form of test. We, you know, uh, we, there's always an element of risk when you're. Uh, you're risking your ego when you play in a chess chess match. Uh, you're risking uh, your ego and sometimes your life, depending on <laughs> when you're doing certain kinds of flying. But in fact, I'm overemphasizing. I mean, I mean, I really don't think I do things that are in danger of my life when I fly or in danger of my life. I mean, we, we were in a very nasty boat race from, from Sydney to Hobart. We were in a, in a storm for 14 hours. But I really never felt my like I was going to die. Sometimes I felt like I wanted to die <laughs> because literally everyone on board got pretty sick, including and they're all professional sailors. It was a horrible storm, and we had a lot of a lot of professional sailors were puking. Uh, but uh, I never really felt the same kind of deep fear I, I felt as a child. I think most overachievers are 
are driven uh, not so much by the pursuit of success, but by the fear of failure. Uh, but again, the, the, you know, unless failure gets very close and very nearby, uh, that fear doesn't reach profound levels. But it drives us, it, dri it drives me, it drives me to work very hard. It, it drives me to make sure that my life is orderly, uh, that I'm in control of my company or in control of the airplane or boat or what have you so that I'm, I'm not at risk of failure. And whenever I feel even remotely close to being at risk of failure, I can't stop working. There are an enormous number of people in the world who really want standard answers. They want everyone to wear their hair the same way, everyone to conduct business the same way, everyone to dress the same way, everyone go to the same church. You know, there's a very, you know, and, and, and if you wander outside of these norms, people are highly critical because it's threatening to them. Uh, because they're living their life one way and they believe that's the proper way to live their life. And if you live your life a different way and you, you answer questions differently, they, that makes them feel very uncomfortable. And they say, well, this person's different from I am, but I am. And then they have to say, then they simply go a little further and they say, this person's different and wrong and I'm different and right. And so people, you know, people have been, you know, very, very, you know, very, very critical and people will be critical of you if you do things a little bit differently. Uh, it takes a certain amount of, of strength not to succumb to fashion. I to try to think things through and I, I try to always ask two questions about my personal policies in life. Uh, uh, are, they, are they fair? Are they morally correct? And do they work? Uh, so, I, you know, and I try to reason, reason things back from, from first principles. I try to think about things and come to conclusions and make my own decisions. And um, if other people are, if, if I've thought things through, and, you know, if someone has a logical criticism that can explain to me why what I'm doing is wrong and they can convince me, I'll change. If they, really can, you know, if they have good reasons, I mean, I'll just alter my behavior. I love it when people point out I'm wrong, explain to me why I'm wrong, and I then change. That's great. I don't want to be, I don't want to be wrong. I would love to be right. I'd love to, uh, and if I am wrong, I love it when, pe when, when people stop me. But if people just you know, throw labels at you and throw criticisms around that are not rational and they call you basically call you names uh, you can't change your behavior that you think is right just because someone's calling your names and, it, and it's not convention not the conventional way of behaving most of the time I let it go uh, sometimes people have a way of saying things that are so hurtful and so offensive and, and so, or say things that are just patently untrue that I feel like I have to defend myself uh, so if someone says something that's factually an error they just said Larry did this and I didn't do that, then I'll defend myself. But if they say, if, if it's just calling me a random name, then I forget it. I think academic success is an advantage. I think academic success is an advantage. But it by no means assures success in business. I think if you're an outstanding student, you're probably going to be reasonably successful in business. You might not be amongst the most successful people in, in, in business or even in science. Uh, the straight-A students uh, sometimes are, well, well there, there's no doubt that they have talent. Uh, maybe it would be better if they got in straight A's in math and physics, but flunked a, a sociology course where the professor was just awful or got a C in a sociology course where that there wasn't a need to always please, always do well, even if it didn't make sense to do well and put in the effort. Uh, so it's very, it's very, inter it's very interesting. So I, what, what you look for, at least what we look for when we're hiring, hiring people are people that certainly have a strong aptitude uh, in mathematics and in physics and in music, which is very highly correlated to mathematics. Uh, but also people who make judgments as to where they're going to invest their time. Uh, wonderful story about a young man who was near the top of his class at Carnegie Mellon and quit the, the, the week before he, uh, the, work, the week before he was going to graduate. Without going into all, all of the details, it was that interesting judgment that that he made uh, that he was just going to bail, uh, bail out, uh, that uh, set him apart. Strangely enough. You know, from a lot of the other very top grads, grads that we have hired, he makes his own decisions, and that's a very useful thing. Uh, and I think we, you know, corporations need a combination of uh, people who 
every, hopefully all the people have, are, you know, are, are talented. Uh, some are people that really want to please and are easy to manage. Others really are kind of driven, you know, to their, you know, to, to a drummer only they can hear, and uh, they will constantly question my wisdom <laughs> and be, won't be the least bit shy about challenging me and hopefully make me, keep me from making mistakes. I think learning how to program is, is a wonderful discipline. Uh, again, can computers are, are, are unforgivingly logical and they'll do exactly what you tell them and it's, it's just a wonderful, again, it's a wonderful training to learn, to learn how to program a computer. So uh, I would encourage people to take, to take this up uh, very much, it's much more important than handwriting. I just finished uh, uh, Vincent Cronin's uh, book on Napoleon, a man who definitely needed better PR. You know, they just spun, you know, spun uh, Napoleon very badly with, with proper, proper PR people. Uh, Napoleon was an uh, codified the laws for the first time in Europe. He freed, uh, he, free, you know, he was constantly eliminating kings and other tyrants. Uh, he opened the ghettos and stopped religious discrimination. Uh, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary man. He wrote a lot of laws himself. Uh, he was incredibly polite, generous, you know, generous almost to a fault. Uh, a, a, re a remarkable person who was vilified, you know, really was vilified by who? The kings that he deposed. <laughs> so the kings were not, not thrilled. The kings, you know, the kings of England and the, king, uh, the old king of France and the, and the kings of Prussia and the Tsar of Russia we're all threatened by this man who is bringing, you know, bringing democracy. And I, I think it's interesting to, to read this book and, and look at Napoleon and see how history has tre you know, treated this man. There's even the expression, uh, uh, he's got a, what, what is it called, Napoleon complex or Napoleon, you know, Napoleon was of average height for a French person. The idea is not, yeah, it's, it's, it's just preposterous. Uh, the treating maybe the most gifted man of the uh, of of the uh, 19th century, as some kind of despot, he was a liberator, uh, a lawgiver, uh, and a, ma a man of just incredible gifts. And he never considered himself a soldier. He considered himself a politician, though he's probably the most the greatest soldier, the greatest general, in, perhaps in all history. And uh, I think it's. It's interesting to read about him for, for a couple of reasons, to see what one man of, of modest birth can do with his life, uh, and to see how history can distort the truth entirely. And that the job of historians uh, is often just that, to distort history, to, to, because history is based on fashion. So we constantly change America, we're, we're changing American history all the time. Uh, and whatever is politically fashionable, the school, you know, the, the school districts decide that they want to emphasize this person in history and de-emphasize that person in history. So we're constantly rewriting history all, all the time. Uh, and it's interesting and illuminating to come to understand that even history is based on fashion. Even morality, popular morality, is based on fashion. Real morality is based on reason. And never make the mistake between the two. The opportunity in this country is astounding. Everyone who works hard and maybe a little cleverly has the opportunity to, you know, to make almost anything possible. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's the American dream, that anything here is possible. Uh, we are not held back. Uh, that immigrants come here and in a single generation do extraordinary things. Uh, that um, this country is not perfect but compared with every other country in the world, <laughs> it's absolutely fabulous. And there is unlimited opportunity. It requires hard work. It requires a little bit of luck. Uh, but still, in America, anything is possible.